Good morning, everybody. Pastor Mike here with another Watchman Pure Bible Study, Revelation chapter 8. We're, da -da -da, we're blowing the trumpets, sounding the alarm. We're sounding the alarm. We're gathering the people is what we're doing. We're gathering, um, gathering the Gentiles uh, to be caught away. We're gathering. Uh, that's, what, that's what trumpets represent. Represents gathering his people. Um, we're also gathering Israel together, and God is going to have to deal with them. God promised all throughout the Old Testament He was going to deal with them. He was going to, He was going to deal with them for their sin. Um, he was going to remove all of her old ways away from her. He was going to show her signs that His coming was near. Then He was going to pour out His love and His blessings to to Israel to the. Um, the remnant of the 12 tribes is what the Bible says, the way the Bible lays it out. So in Revelation chapter 8, I want you to kind of keep that in mind as these trumpets are blowing, because as we like to do, we, we, we can just simply look and say um, in, um, in Revelation chapter 8, verse 8, the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. We can just say, okay, that's going to happen. Now let's move right along. We can do that. But let's go back and look at, I mean, obviously this is a, it's a symbol of something. There's something about, and I believe in the literal interpretation of the scripture, but there's something more that I think the Bible's wanting to share with us of, why is it that God took a mountain and threw it into the sea? And by the way, I mean, you stop and think about this for a minute, okay? <clears throat> a God that's powerful enough to pick up a mountain and cast it into the sea, that's pretty powerful. Okay, I mean, he's, he's strong. And so God's going to do this, and he's going to do it in front of his people. He's going to show his power and his strength. Um, let's go to Job chapter 9, because this was what, uh, this was what uh, Job was getting at here, uh, concerning how much power God has, and how much authority, and how much ability he has. One, thing, one of the things that really, 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 really bugs me about the word faith doctrine Okay, is that it says at, at, at its core, at the core of the word faith doctrine is this. God is just powerless to do anything until you release him in your faith. He can't, he can't do anything until you release him with your supernatural energy faith. Um, I actually went to a funeral. Of a, uh, of a young lady that had died. She, 12 years old, died in her sleep. Natural causes, okay? Couldn't figure it out. <clears throat> one, of the, uh, one of the dear saints in our church, her son is an independent Baptist preacher, and he, he did part of the ceremony. And I loved what he had to say. He's a solid King James man. But there was another pastor involved, and he was, uh, he was a charismatic word faith pastor. His was the second message of this girl's funeral. And he just, it was not God's will for her to die. God lost a, a great thing here when she died. It was not God's will. And I'm going, oh, come on. I wanted to just climb up there and go Ch -ch 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 to the guy. Um, but then, you know, the, uh, Pastor uh, Waymeyer got up and preached an outstanding message. And there was even some raised hands at the end because he gave a little, gave a little salvation call at the end. Um, but anyway, this idea that God is weak and powerless until we release him and activate the faith and activate the energy and release. And you've heard all the talk. You've heard all the words. I, I'm so sick of that. If I, if I, if I serve a God that can't, and you, you, you just follow the logic now. If I serve a God that cannot do anything until I say go, that's not a god, that's a, that's a dog, that's a beast, that's an animal, okay? You can train an animal not to move until you say go. Um, god is, that's not the God that I serve. God is more powerful than me. He's wiser than me. God knows when he needs to get up and do something and when he needs not to get up and do something. God knows when to speak and when to not speak. God knows all those things. I don't. I'm not in charge of God. God is in charge of me. God is in charge here. You read what Job said. Job chapter 9, verse 1. <clears throat> this is what he said. Then Job answered and said, I know it is so of a truth, but how should man be just with God? If he will contend with him, 
He cannot answer him one of a thousand. You think about what Job's saying here, okay? You get into an argument with God. God's got all the answers and you don't. You don't have one, okay? He said, he is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who hath hardened himself against him and hath prospered? Which removeth the mountains and they know not. Which overturneth them in his anger. Which shaketh the earth out of her place and the pillars thereof tremble. Which commandeth the sun and it riseth not and sealeth up the stars. Think of uh, in the days of Joshua. Which alone, God alone, spreadeth out the heavens and treadeth upon the waves of the sea. This was written even before Jesus walked on the water. I love this. <clears throat> Verse 9, which maketh Arcturus, Orion, and Pleiades, and the chambers of the south, those are stars and clusters of stars, which doeth great things past finding out, yea, and wonders without number. Lo, he goeth by me, and I see him not. He passeth on also, but I perceive him not. Behold, he taketh away. Who can hinder him? Who shall say unto him, What doest thou? And I, I will admit, I have been in situations like that in life where I'm going, God, what are you doing? Okay? Um, and I don't think God just gets really hacked off at us when he says, How dare you question me? God's not like that. The real God is not like that. The real God wants you to ask questions, and a lot of them. Okay, test the spirits and call unto me and I will answer thee. But as far as us being able to say, God, would you back off here? Let me handle this. I'm, I know this more than you do. Who can do that? Um, one of these uh, big wig, money talking, money grubbing televangelists. Um, actually got on his program in front of his church. And uh, Jesse Duplantis. And he told this yarn about how he visited heaven. And he saw Jesus, and Jesus was crying. And he said, Jesus, come cry on my shoulder. And Jesus went and wept on his shoulder. And, oh, poor G Jesus was just so upset at the church for not believing in him. And I don't know where these people get this. And I don't know why people follow people like that. I mean, I just I really don't understand that concept. Um, but uh, you just get the image here. Job is laying it out and saying, uh, God could pick that mountain up over there and turn it upside down, dump it in the sea if he wanted to. God can do that. Okay? None of us are as big and as powerful as God, especially not the devil. And don't you ever forget that. Don't you personally ever forget that God is more powerful than the devil. He's the creator. He's the created and there's a big difference. Even in Job 28, verse 9, the Bible says, He putteth forth his hand upon the rock. He overturneth the mountains by the roots. And he just sticks his hand out there and picks them up and goes, Phew. and it's nothing, nothing for him to do that. Okay? That's how powerful our God is. When you run into a situation, I want you to be thinking along these lines now because we're going to, we're going to head to this point. You might already be there in your mind. You might already think, hey, Pastor Mike, I kind of know where you're going here. Um, which one of us, upon being asked to remove a mountain, could just pick it up and put it over to the side? You and I cannot do that. God is the one who can do that. So he's, he's showing his power here. He's showing his power to Israel. Psalm 46, and to the rest of the world. The rest, I guarantee you, the rest of the world sees this mountain into the sea. They're going to go, okay. Psalm 46, this is the be still and know that I am God chapter of the Bible. Psalm 46, to the chief musician for the sons of Korah, a song upon Alamoth. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. That means he's right here, right now present with us. That's why I believe in a Bible that's present truth. I don't believe that it just used to be the truth, but it's really, it's not really the whole truth now. You need us learned scholars to tell you the truth. I believe that this Bible is present truth. It is as present as Jesus is right now. And so anyway, he's a very present help in trouble. Did he help Israel of old? Yes. Did he help uh, Paul during his uh, days? Yes. Is he going to help me today? Absolutely. He is always with his people in full strength and in full power. Verse 2, Therefore will not we fear, 
though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. That's what it says right there, okay? Though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. It's Selah, I've heard, I, I, I don't quite know this for sure, but I've heard the word Selah like a musical thing, which means there's a pause there, which kind of gives the idea of, just stop and think about that for a minute, okay? Verse 4, there is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. I mean, everything else, mountains are crumbling, and, but God's city shall not be moved. Okay, just like, just like when we talk about what goes on in Goshen and what goes on in Egypt. Everything's falling apart here in Egypt, but in Goshen, God's got it. Okay? Um, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her in that right early. Think about her. Think about the typology in the Bible of women. Um, the tribes of Israel are typified as a woman. Um, think of um, Ruth and Naomi. Okay? Uh, think of that story in the Bible. Naomi is the old Jewish woman who's lost her husband, lost her sons. She has no one to claim the inheritance. It's lost. It's gone. But God is going to send a Savior in the form of a little baby. Think about that to restore the inheritance back to Naomi. Okay, that's her. Um, God shall help her in that right early. The heathen raged, the kingdoms were moved, and he uttered his voice, and the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Salah. Then verse 8, Come behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still. Now this is God talking. This is not you with your little contemplative prayer deal. Okay? Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. God intervenes in here and he says, let me speak. Okay? Uh, be still. Be still. Everything else is shaking. God says, to you, God says to you right now, just be still. Peace. Be still is what Jesus said in the midst of the storm. Okay? So God is just saying to you, be still. And know that I am God. I'm the one who can pick mountains up and put them in the sea. I can, shake the, I can melt the whole earth if I want to. I'm going to make all the nations crumble all around you. But you're going to be still. You're going to be safe. You're going to be in a sure place. You're going to be dwelling in the secret place of the Most High, under the shadow of the Almighty. And then God said, I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Everybody's going to go, only God can pick up a mountain and throw it into the sea. The Lord of hosts was with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Psalm 83, verse 12. Look here. Uh, again, this is all about God showing his power. Power over what? God's actually... He's, he's, breaking, he's bringing something down, something that right now is hindering Israel from getting saved, from getting to know the real Messiah. There's, there's something that is keeping her from it. Psalm 83, 12, who said, Let us take to ourselves the houses of God in possession. He's talking about the enemies. Verse 13, O oh my God, make them like a wheel, as the stubble before the wind. Think of... Um, think of um, um, Boaz, winnowing barley, okay? Think of John the Baptist who talked about Jesus, talking about whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge the floor of his garner. And that chaff, that stubble, that chaff and everything flies off and it's going to be what? It's going to be burnt up with, with unquenchable fire. Um, and I can tell you from years of experience, years of dedicated experience in serving God, that the, uh, the majority of the blessings and the good things that God has done for me has been through the fire and the tribulation and the winnowing, okay? The sifting, as it were, getting the chaff off of me, this old flesh that I have, getting that off of me, getting it to die off so that the seed underneath that can live. Um, so he says, um, <clears throat> as stumbled before the wind, verse 14, Psalm 83, as the fire burneth a wood... 
And as the, listen to this, as the flame setteth the mountains on fire, so persecute them with thy tempest, and make them afraid with thy storm. Now think of a storm and rain and uh, think of as it was in the days of Noah. This is all going to come on the earth as a flood one of these days. So God, he says, so persecute them with thy tempest. Talking about the heathen and, and the wicked of the world. Persecute them and make them afraid with thy storm. Verse 16, fill their faces with shame that they may seek thy name, O Lord. Let them be confounded and troubled forever. Yea, let them be put to shame and perish that men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the most high over all the earth. Again, this is, this is about God showing who's God here. Who really is God? And, and just think of the showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And it was all about showing Israel who the real God is. And this is showing God's power and God's strength. Now, uh, over in Isaiah chapter 2, let's look there. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 11. The Bible says, the lofty looks of man shall be humbled. Okay, again, man thinks he's, the devil promised Eve, you should be his gods. Okay, and man right now has a huge God complex. Okay, I, I'm, I'm my own man. No man, no God tells me what to do. I rule myself. And that's lofty looks. That's a proud look. Okay, that's, that's exalting yourself. God says, the lofty looks of man shall be humbled. The haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Now, I want you to just unhook the prophecy train here for a minute and hook on the this is my life train. Think about when God finally got a hold of you, okay? Um, did you, in the, at the end of the praise and worship service, run down with your hands going, Praise Jesus, I want to serve God. I want to serve God all my life. I want to be a Christian. I want to announce I'm a Christian. Is that what happened? No. When God got a hold of you, I mean, he got a hold of you. You know what he did? He cut that lofty look off your face. He brought down your haughtiness. He bowed you down. And the Lord alone was exalted in your life. I've been there. Okay? I used, to be, I used to be cocky, arrogant, full of myself, full of pride. I can do all things through Mike. That's, I mean, that's how I, that's how I felt. When I, when I took my first church as, um, uh, to be a pastor, um, it was in my 20s, and God had just then let me kind of dabble in pastoring a church a little bit. I wasn't still quite, it was a part-time church. I wasn't quite ready yet. Still had a lot of arrogance in me. And I remember telling myself at the time, Mike, you are so talented. You have such speaking abilities. You can do music. You can play that piano and sing while you can make people just, oh, that guy is so wonderful. Mike, there probably isn't a church anywhere that wouldn't die to have you. I'm not making this up. I told myself that one day. Whew, boy, am I ever sorry I did that. Oh, I cannot begin to tell you how sorry I am I did that. You might have been on that experience too. Or you thought you could just do it on your own. You can do, you can just do it. You've got it, you've got what it takes. You've done just fine. You can just do it yourself. Okay? I remember um, some next-door neighbors when I was growing up, two, two boys that we grew up with. Um, their father died at a young age uh, when they were both children. They grew up just with their mother in a home. And I remember uh, they were grown up men. Uh, the oldest boy was a few years older than me. And my mom told me that when their mom died, she died of liver cancer. When their mom died, she went to the oldest boy, whose name was James, and she said, James... Uh, you know where your daddy is. You know your daddy's in heaven. He, her dad, their dad had just got saved just before he died. And she said, I want you to know that I'm praying for you, and God is here to help you with it. His wife, this guy's wife, jumped in there and said, he's got two strong shoulders on his own. He'll take care of this himself. Yeah. It doesn't work. Okay? It doesn't work. The Lord alone 
It's going to be exalted in that day. God, you listen to this, God will never play second fiddle in your band. Never. He'll never be in the co-pilot seat. Never. God is always alone going to be exalted in your life. And if you don't seek him first and his kingdom and his righteousness, he'll fix it to where you ain't got nothing else. Okay? Been there, done that. Got a t-shirt out of it. Okay? Verse 12, For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty and upon every one that is lifted up. Right now, and I will tell you this, there is none more arrogant in this world than the Jew. They are the most arrogant, cocky people in the world. Okay? The nation of Israel. And I, I love Israel and I love, I, I, you know my heart for Israel. Okay, but right now, they're just, they're just full of pride. And Jewish, Jewish especially re religious Jews, are full of pride. That's, that was their problem in Christ's day. That's been their problem all along, was they're full of pride. So what's God going to do? Okay, for the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty, and upon everyone that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. God's got to bring them down. And so I, I can just, you know, just we always try to draw scenarios of what's going to happen in our mind and when it's all going to kick loose. I see a scenario where right now the nation of Israel that exists is gone. Okay? I think that those stones, the remainder stones of the, uh, of the Temple Mount, that, that, that wailing wall they call it, where the Jews still go, that's the last remnant of what used to be the Temple. Okay? Remember what Jesus said, not one stone will be left on another. Well, there's still stones there. Did Jesus not anticipate or did it not? It wasn't fulfilled yet in A.D. 70, but it's going to be fulfilled. Okay? And I think that God is absolutely going to get a hold of Israel one last time in such a violent, terrible way. He's going to get their attention. He's going to bring them down low. Verse 13, upon all the cedars of Lebanon. You remember what Solomon put in his temple. Uh, the cedars, the beautiful, beautiful cedars of Lebanon. Okay? It's going to be upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, and upon all the high mountains, and upon all the hills that are lifted up, and upon every high tower, and upon every fence wall, and upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon all pleasant pictures, and the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Verse 18. And the idols he shall utterly abolish. God has got to get Israel out of idol worship. Okay? Um, verse 19, And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and in the caves of the earth for the fear uh, of the Lord. And, um, and I'm missing something here. I need to turn in my Bible. I missed something. I truncated my text and my paper. I thought I could get by with my cheat sheet here. Let me make sure I'm reading all of this. Okay? Isaiah chapter 2. Uh, let's see here, verse 19. They shall go into the holes of the rocks and in the caves of the earth for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. That's exactly what he's going to do. He is going to bring down all the high mountains. They're all going to come down and, and God's going to show Israel exactly what he's made of. Uh, Jeremiah 51. I, I like this. I want to, in fact, I have it right here. Jeremiah 51, verse 24. I want you to turn your Bibles there, and I'm going to turn my Bible to uh, Jeremiah because I want you to get this picture. Okay? Um, there's a mountain that's going to be cast, it's going to be picked up and cast into the sea. Okay? Um, <clears throat> I want you to think uh, Israel right now. Uh, I, I really was kind of taken aback when, when, I, when I found out that these, you know, you've seen these ultra-Orthodox Jews, you know, with the curls and, you know, all the stuff. Um, the vast majority of their religious practice is the Kabbalah. It's mysticism. It's, it's witchcraft. It's Jewish witchcraft is what it is. Um, it is Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, that is, that is lording over Israel right now in her mind, okay? They think that they, there are some Jews who just think that they can just go to the temple, go to the synagogue every week and be good people and, you know, just, uh, you know, try to be nice to people and be good Jews and everything. And God, that's not going to work, 
And there, there are some who are practicing witchcraft, calling it Judaism. They're practicing witchcraft through the Kabbalah, which is mystery religion. It's all about turning people into gods. It's the same religion that's everywhere else in the world. And God has absolutely, ha God has to shatter the stronghold of the occult away from Israel. You've seen, you've seen what I've seen. The, uh, the parliament buildings and the, the, the Supreme Court buildings, I think is what it is in, in Jerusalem, uh, built by the Rothschilds and with all the squares and compasses and obelisks and all-seeing eyes and, you know, staircases. and I mean, everything that, all the occult signatures that are over that, I'm telling you, there is a mystery harlot spirit that is reigning and has a stronghold over the, the nation of Israel right now. God's got to break that. He's got to break that and get and remove it, so that Israel can her so the scales can come off her eyes, so she can see who the real Messiah is. And so keep that in mind. Jeremiah 51. Here's what God said. God said, "I will render unto Babylon and to all the inhabitants of Chaldea all their evil that they have done in Zion in your sight," saith the Lord. See where they do the evil in Zion. Okay. Verse 25, Behold, I am against thee, O destroying mountain, saith the Lord. Babylon, the destroying mountain, which destroyest all the earth. And I will stretch out my hand upon thee, and roll thee down from the rocks, and will make thee a burnt mountain. That's what he said. Okay? Verse 26, And they shall not take of thee a stone for a corner, nor a stone for foundations, but thou shalt be desolate forever, saith the Lord. You know what God's saying here? Okay, God's saying that my people have built their temples out of Babylon. They've taken the stones, her stones, her ideologies, her philosophies, her theologies, her, her witchcrafts. They have taken her and built their religious houses with it. And God said, I'm going to so utterly destroy this destroying mountain. I'm going to put her on fire. I'm going to turn her over. I'm going, to, I'm going to mess her up bad so that Israel won't have anything left of her to build anything with. I mean, look at, look at, they shall not take of thee a stone for a corner, nor a stone for foundations. Now think of, think of the opposite of that. Here we have Christ, the chief cornerstone, not built from Mystery Babylon, but built from heaven, who is the foundation of the church, the solid rock upon which the church is built. And so um, the same is true with Babylon. Everybody builds their religion on something. You're either going to build it on the true religion, undefiled, which is built upon the foundation of the apostles, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, or you build it from Babylon. But what God's going to do is he's going to eliminate Babylon. So what, and, and I'll tell you, he did that with me. Um, the reason why I love this book so much is that God just pretty much put all the other ones out of business for me. And I just went back. In the days of my worst trouble, I found myself always going back to the King James. It just, just felt like the Word of God. Okay? And so I've tried to build my life and my ministry and my, my personality, my, my character, my marriage, my children, my church. I've tried to build that upon the, the cornerstone of this Bible and the foundation of what it says. Uh, that's because God did me a favor and he destroyed Babylon for me. So that's what he said he was going to do. And then in, in Jeremiah uh, chapter 51, same, I'm going to look here in my Bible here. Um, God says in verse 60, the Bible says, So Jeremiah wrote in a book all the evil that should come upon Babylon, even all these words that are written against Babylon. And Jeremiah said to Sariah, When thou comest to Babylon, and shalt see, and shalt read all these words, then shalt thou say, O Lord, thou hast spoken against this place to cut it off, that none shall remain in it, neither man nor beast, with that it shall be desolate forever." And it shall be, I, I like this, it shall be when thou hast made an end of reading this book, that thou shalt bind a stone to it and cast it into the midst of Euphrates. And thou shalt say, thus shall Babylon sink. Now I want you to notice that all these curses are written, and they're written against Babylon. He takes the curses, oh I like this, takes the curses and write them and, and binds it to a stone, okay, 
Uh, thou shalt bind it to a stone and cast it in the midst of the river. Thus shall Babylon sink and shall not rise from the evil that I will bring upon her, and they shall be weary. Thus far the words of Jeremiah. Now, I love the imagery of this. Here's the, here's the curse that is against us. The curse against Babylon, the influence of Babylon, and everything about this false, phony religion that everybody else's religion in the whole world, including your own that's not built upon Christ, is built upon. And God says, take it, bind a stone to it, Cast it in the river Euphrates. By the way, where's our sin, by the way? Okay, it's in the depths. A river Euphrates or the depths of the sea, it's the same thing. They're down in the bottom of the sea, and they're not ever going to come back up. Can you stop and think about that? He's cast our sins in the depth, depths of the sea. They're not coming back up. They're not coming out against us. And once God takes the curse from us and puts it there and binds it and casts it into the sea, never rises again shall not rise from the evil that I will bring upon her, and they shall be weary. Thus far the words of Jeremiah. Now, in case you've already gotten ahead of me, take your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 21. Okay? Have you thought of, when you read this saying in, in Revelation chapter 8, verse 8, about a mountain, as it were a mountain, being cast into the sea, did you ever think of something in the Bible that sounded something like a mountain being removed into the sea? Okay? I like this. Matthew chapter 21, okay? Um, let me give you a little humorous illustration, okay? Have you ever been to Denver, Colorado? Okay, Denver, Colorado. Uh, Denver, Colorado is a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting representation of America, okay? Because what happened was um, everybody in America, they were all, it all came from Europe, Okay, the adventurous people came from Europe and they settled along the East Coast. Okay? That wasn't good enough, so we need to stretch our legs a little bit. And so they started moving westward. And they moved through Kentucky and Tennessee and Missouri and Arkansas. And then they got into the, the flatlands. Of, if, you look at, if you're not familiar with America, you look at America, you have the flatlands. You have Texas and Oklahoma and Kansas, and North and South Dakota, and, and uh, Nebraska up there. I mean, you got all those, that line of states there where it's a lot of grassy plains, okay? Easy to, and a lot of farmers said, you know what, this is good enough right here for us. But people still wanted to push west, and they were, had it easy going through the grassy plains. And then they got to Denver, Colorado, okay? Denver, Colorado is just right on these grassy plains, and then you have the Rocky Mountains, okay? And it's like everybody got to Denver, Colorado, and they went, um, we're staying here. Honey, we're staying here, okay? We're not climbing that. You know why? Because men can't move mountains. Couldn't get them out of the way. They're still there, by the way, okay? Some men traversed them, and a lot of people died. But it, that's just an interesting thing. When we run into mountains, we just go, we're done. Can't, I can't climb that. I can't, I can't move it. I can't go underneath it. can't go around it. We're done. Mountains tend to be barriers. Okay? So I want you to think about that. And think about uh, barriers to your, to your spiritual walk with the Lord. Think about that. And Babylon, she's like all over those things. Remember, Babylon is the one who sits on seven mountains. Okay? She sits on them. And there's something interesting about that, uh, something in the law. And I've pointed this out before. Uh, when a woman is in her uncleanness uh, during her cycle, uh, the law was pretty specific that she was to be unclean so many days and anything that she had wearing was unclean for so many days. And every place that she sat upon was unclean. Whenever, if she sat upon it, it's unclean. Okay? This woman is a harlot woman, and she is unclean, and she's sitting on, so you know what she's done? She's defiled them. They're unclean, okay? So this mountain thing represents uh, religious barriers. It represents whatever thing in your life that's keeping you, from, keeping you from serving the Lord, okay? So Matthew chapter 21, verse 19. Here's what God's, here's what God's showing us in Revelation. When he saw the fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon 
is the fig tree withered away? Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith, and doubt not, you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if you shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done, and all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Now, the charismatic word faith gobbledygooks have taken this and they have twisted it around and made witchcraft out of it. Okay? And they say, see, obviously, you just don't have enough faith to do whatever. Okay? They don't follow their line of, don't follow their reasoning, don't follow their logic, don't follow anything like that. Stay away from them. Okay? You just follow the scriptures. Now, I let, for years, I let that kind of teaching scare me into saying, well, it, I wouldn't really teach or preach on these verses because it, it, it just, I didn't want to sound charismatic, but I, I just had it in my mind that maybe some things with God were impossible, that maybe he couldn't do some things. Boy, was I wrong. God is able to show us that even mountains are nothing to him, that he can pick them up and turn them on upside down, burn them on fire if he wanted to, and cast them into the sea, and it's nothing for him to do that. Now, when he says faith and doubting not, okay, let me tell you what that means, and I'm going to, I like for people to be free. I like to just say things that just make people free, okay? Um, let me, let me just give the illustration of what happened. Uh, this is, I'm recording this on Wednesday. The previous Sunday morning, uh, if you were watching our live service, you saw me just about pass out just as I started preaching. Okay? Um, and, and I wrote about it on the blog. I started a blog Sunday night so I could tell people what happened. It's uh, PastorMikeHoggard.com. That's our new blog. And I'm just kind of putting just personal things on there. Well, what happened was every Sunday, for some reason, I, I get I, there's a real battle going on in my body. It doesn't it hasn't happened today, it didn't happen yesterday or Monday and, or any other day, but for some reason on Sunday at church time, I mean there's just a real battle in my in my inward parts here. Okay, and um, a wave came over me Sunday morning, right as I'm starting to preach. That would, it made me so nauseous. That it just, it's, you know, how you feel right before you're fixing the blah, okay? That's how I felt. It just was so sickening. It went away, but it just kind of weakened me a little bit. And so I sat on the end of the stage and preached the sermon. Let me tell you what I did. That morning, when, before I left the house, I prayed. I got alone in my office, and I was reading a little few things out of the Scripture, and I prayed, I was just praying about the service and about the message. And I just wanted God to show up. I wanted God to do something for his people. And I said, God, it's your people, it's your church. Oh, and by the way, God, please don't let that little thing happen to me. Don't, don't let my bowels loose or whatever, my guts. and don't, don't let that happen, okay? I ask God specifically for that. And I trust God. I trust him, okay? Now... You can come up with this, well, you just didn't have enough faith, all you want to. God knows my heart. I just, my, my body and my life are in God's hands, totally. You don't believe that? Go read Job. The devil didn't have any power or authority over Job, but what God let him have. Okay? It, the Bible is very simple in that. And so what happened was, God allowed that to happen. Why? But, but I prayed, God, I, I don't want that to happen. You know what God did? God actually gave me something that to me was better than what I had asked for. He did. He gave me something that for me was actually better than what I had asked for. I had asked God, don't let that happen. God said, I'm gonna, it's, a, it's a thorn, I'm going to leave it there, and I'm going to give you grace. I'm going to show you my power through your weakness. That's what I'm going to do. The guy sent me an email the other night. I said, Pastor Mike, I watched that. I bawled. He said, that message was so powerful to me. It just really, really shook me. And I'm going, I don't think it was. I mean, I just don't think it was. But it was the power of God. That is actually what I am more interested in in anything than having health in my body. You know why? 
because I trust God and I have confidence in God. I trust Him because I found out I can't trust myself and my own judgment. Okay? I could have stomped my foot like a little charismatic and said, I claim this in Jesus' name. By the way, a lot of things that they claim that they say that they got, they're faking. Okay? I, just, I don't know if you know that. They're faking. They made it up. They're making it look like God answered their prayer. The truth is, He didn't. Okay? What I'm telling you is, is that you know what faith is? Faith is believing the Bible. That's what faith is. You know what it means to doubt not? It means don't doubt what's written in this book. That's what that means. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Faith and the Word of God are always linked together all throughout the Scriptures. If you say, you know what, I think, this, I think part of the Bible's wrong, you have no faith. You have no confidence in the Bible. You have no trust in the Bible. You have doubts about, about this Bible. And I'm going to tell you something. You cannot doubt God's Word and then say, but God, I trust you. But I, this Bible... <laughs> I, I, was to, I found out that there's manuscript errors in this, I, and so I can't trust it. I'm just telling you, that's, it's as simple as that. Do you believe every word that's written in this book? And I do. And I'm telling you, mountains will disappear. Okay? And in a, in a literal fashion. I, I don't have it all drawn out in my mind yet. But I, 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 I think, okay, I think that what, God, what Jesus said here in Matthew chapter 21... I see the fulfillment of it here in Revelation chapter 8. The second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. I see this happening here. And because some people said, we believe. We believe the word of God. Okay? Uh, just wanted to share that with you. Next week, uh, I may talk about the sea becoming blood. A uh, third part of the creatures were in the sea and had life died, and third part of the ships were destroyed, and a third angel. I didn't get into that third part. I'm going to make a note here. Okay? That is a neat little, little study. When you study things that are threes, and one of them is like the third, it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful little study. Okay? So I'm going to try to remember to, to study that and bring it forth to you next, next week. All right? This is Pastor Mike. I love you. I can tell you. Okay? Trust God trust him. I do. I trust him. And if God wants to weaken me, weaken my body or weaken my mouth, or if God wants to weaken me to show himself strong to people, I am all for that. I trust him. I absolutely trust him. And you know what? Just because I asked God to put a little healing in my body, and he didn't, he actually did something better than that. And I'll take it. I'll take it every day. It's Pastor Mike. I love you. God bless you. We'll see you the next time. Bye-bye.